The wonder child is the most creative aspect of our being and is the part that bears the most likeness to our creator. Our task is to use this force to transform our lives into unique works of art. I want to talk today about the child as a source of regeneration, that life itself is about regeneration. Life is ever unfolding. I wrote my master's thesis on Nietzsche, the German philosopher who, who presented the doctrine of the overman, the ubermensch, which has falsely been translated as superman. That, that isn't what he meant by it. What he meant by it was the overman, that, that we're always needing to overcome and become, become more than we were. Now, in our journey to wholeness, we began looking at the wounded child. Uh, we began by talking about the need to break our denials and change behavior. We, we talked about the, the pain that we have to go through to heal those wounds. Remember the child because the child will remember. The child will keep acting out or acting in. We talked about championing the child. And we've talked about the spiritual emergence that comes out of that. When we touch that child, when we, we reconnect with, with who we are. A uh, wonderful quotation uh, from Rachel V. Uh, in a book called The Family Secret. She says, it's important to understand that the need to find the child is part of an ancient human longing. Behind our individual past lies our cultural past contained in myths. In myths, we see that the child is often the offspring of the union and the divine. It is the mythical child that we seek as well as the child of our personal history. Now, what that quotation says to me is that it's not about just being an adult child of an alcoholic or a rageaholic or a violent family, that it's about every human being, that there is a need in every human being's life uh, to find out who they are, to find out, to connect with this child that lives inside of us, which is our authentic self, and to allow that child to unfold within us. One of the ways that, that I talk about this uh, is like this, that the wonder child before adapting, it's like this little star that was you. And, and if you think about this in so, something like that, that there was a, an energy going off in all directions and that this was the sphere of consciousness that each one of us had this connection with all consciousness in the beginning, that this wonder child wanted to expand was the life spark. Life is always trying to overcome itself. Life is always trying to expand. And, and, but, but what we have to do in order to grow up is we have to live in a culture and uh, we have to adapt in order to survive. So one of the ways that I talk about it is that this, this child, this, this wonder child, had to adapt a false self or an ego, what we call the ego, which is this black circle, and, and everybody does. It's not like it's something bad. You've got to have one. Your, your ego is your sociocultural self. It's the self that came out of your family. It's a self that comes out of your culture that you have to adapt and survive with. Now, it's always a false self in the sense that a, the culture, your family, your church, your religion, whatever it is, has already decided before you were born what it was, you know, how you were supposed to be in order to get it right. And, and, and so each one of us had to adapt. Now, there was a certain point in our life where we came to a point where we had to say, wait a minute, is that really me? Is that who I want to be? And that's for everybody, not just adult children. Although, you know, if you've been following the programs in, in this series, I think most everybody is an adult child in the sense that everybody's got some woundedness in their child. But, but let's say you grew up in a wonderful family and there was nurturing and it was humanly 
was a human family. It wasn't a perfect family. There would still be a need for you to find out who you are. The unexamined life is not worth living. So, so there's always this part of us that needs to find out what is the difference that makes the difference. That the who am I? What is the difference that makes the difference? And, and that means for all of us that we're going to have to work through this false self, this sociocultural self, or this wounded child, this adapted child self. And that when we do then, we begin to open ourselves up to this larger sphere of consciousness. We begin to find out who we really are. And as we touch who we really are, we touch the life spark in us. We touch the life spark in us. We find out, you know, what, what is my difference that makes the difference. Now, one of the ways following Rachel V's statement uh, that, that I like to look at this is what is called the divine child in exile myth. There's, there's in, back through all mythology you have the story of the divine child in exile. If you want a modern version of it, it was E.T. Uh, E.T. was the alien. He was, he was the displaced person. Uh, so the divine child in exile, uh, Spielberg made this wonderful movie with that myth. Obviously, the story of Jesus' birth, which I'm not going to talk about the historicity of that story. Many biblical scholars believe that that story is a form of Haggadah Midrashim, which was an interpretive kind of story rather than a literal story. But I don't want to, you know, violate anybody's belief systems. Uh, the divine child in exile myth is there in the Jesus story. Moses in the bulrushes is another story of, of the extraordinary child, Romulus and Remus. Uh, if we go back in mythology, we'll find tons of stories of a child of divine origin or a child of unusual origin. That's what the story always says. Now, what I believe is, I'm going to go through the, the elements of the divine child and exile myth. I believe that myths are stories that come out of the collective unconscious. That is, these are our stories. These are the human stories. Every, every one of us uh, has to kill our father and kill our mother like Oedipus and Electra. Uh, the, these Greek myths are literally these fantastic stories that touch our own personal psychology. A and it's enormously important that we understand that those stories are, are like metaphors of what everybody's life has to be. Now, obviously, I don't mean kill our parents in literally but each one of us is called to leave home. Each one of us is called to move out of that family and become our own person, become the unique person we were meant to be. Each one of us very much needs to de-mythologize, uh, if you will, what you were told about yourself. Because what you were told about yourself in your family was an interpretation of you. And if your mom and dad were adult children, like. I think so many were in these multi-generational patterns, then what they told you about you was a projection of their own inner child. So how do I find the truth of myself? How do I find the truth of myself? I, I want to go through these elements. In the Divine Child and Exile myth, Otto Rank did a lot of study of this, and he assembled, I've just, I've summarized the points that... Uh, the child is of uh, un unusual or divine origin. Uh, the child has some kind of unusual birth. Uh, if you read the stories of myths, uh, you're dropped into the sea or you're, you're, you're born uh, in, with the elemental forces. Uh, the child is extraordinary. The child is extraordinary. The old order is threatened. Herod pronounces, let's kill all the two-year-olds. The old order is threatened by the birth of this child. There is something about the uniqueness and the unusualness of this child that is threatening to the old order. Now, I don't, I don't have to go much further than that. To be, can you begin to feel a kind of a deep connection with these elements? 
of your own life that, uh, you know, you were unique. There had never been anyone like you. There would never be anyone like you. There will never be anyone like you again. Did you threaten uh, the old order to some way? Did they tell you stop being the way you are and be the way you're supposed to be? Be the way you're supposed to be when you live in this family? Uh, and, and you're not going to stay in this household, young lady. Um, uh, mister, who do you think you are? Uh, what's the matter with you? See, see, I think this wound is there in varying degrees to every one of us. Uh, the child must be hidden. The child must be hidden. Uh, and so, and of course, in the, in the Jesus, Jesus, the story of Jesus, uh, he's, he's born in a manger and, and the shepherds take care of him and the elemental forces celebrate. And uh, we could go through several other uh, mythologies that have the divine child and exile elements. Elemental forces, ordinary people, shepherds take care of the child. Uh, the child is lowly, or the child, there's nothing very dramatic about the child's life. The child has a hard time, if you will. And then finally, at some point, the child recognizes his or her extraordinariness. The child begins to recognize his or her extraordinariness and begins to own that I am a divine child or begins to own that I am unique and special, begins to own that I'm a wonder child, or begins to own that I'm made in the image of God, uh, what, whatever it is that you come to believe about yourself, but that you are unique, that there's never been anybody like you, and that there never will be anybody like you again, it is at least true, uh, if not more, so, so what I'm suggesting is that it's important for all of us to come to understand that we are divine children in exile, or we are extraordinary, we are unique, and we've been in exile, and that we had to work through what? You had to work through your original pain. This is your original pain. The old order was threatened. You had to be hidden. The child couldn't be. See, I think it's very important, it's been very important for me as a recovering person to realize that it's not just because I came from an alcoholic family and that, that I can become a kind of an elitist cult, uh, you know, because uh, I am a recovering uh, alcoholic and I came from an alcoholic family. I think that what we're dealing with is a human problem that everybody needs to make. Every human life is a heroic journey. Every single human being is going to encounter dragons along the way and obstacles. The obstacles may be the color you are. It may be the, that you're born Jewish or you're Baptist or you're Catholic or you're in the wrong place or you're in the whatever. It may be that your father died or your mother died when you were young, that you've had to go it alone or you had to fend for yourself. In some cases, it may be that you were, you know, put up for adoption or that you were orphaned. But, and, and some stories are much more difficult. Some journeys seem much more difficult than others. But all of us are on a heroic journey. And all of us have, my belief, this divine spark. All of us are made in the image of our creator. All of us have the possibility of owning that uniqueness that we are. I, I think about my own life. I went to a seminary when I was 21 I, to study to be a priest. Uh, in, in a sense, I had been told early on that I had a vocation. A vocation, uh, when I was in the Catholic school, they said, I think you have a vocation. I don't know how they could figure this out. Uh, <laughs> But I, but I kind of think what some of those sweet old Irish nuns did is they, they, they thought anybody that was real smart, let's see if we can make him be a priest. Uh, and, uh, but anyway, I was told that early on, and I was a kid that I've described a lot of my really troubled adolescence. When I went to the seminary, it was like a refuge. It was like a haven. I put on a black cassock and a collar, and they all called me father. Uh, I could hardly blow my nose. Uh, and suddenly everyone was calling me father. I was a hero in my 
family because, boy, one of our boys was going to be a priest. And, and when I was in the seminary, I struggled. After the first three or four years, I struggled. And by the seventh year, because I was in there about nine years, I began to read people like Nietzsche, uh, Dostoevsky, uh, Kierkegaard, Kafka. And, and, and if you know these people, these are 19th century existentialists. Now, believe me, I'm reading these people when everybody else is reading Thomas Aquinas. Uh, <laughs> And you're supposed to read Thomas Aquinas. A Dostoevsky, I found out, was an adult child. His dad was a drunk. His dad was murdered by his own servants when Dostoevsky was a young boy. Dostoevsky had a terrible life. I mean, to be this brilliant, creative genius, uh, he, he had a very troubled life. He never reclaimed and championed his wounded inner child. Uh, and, and so there's something about those great artists like Dostoevsky that I'd flat don't understand. Somehow their wonder kid breaks through in some way that doesn't happen, at least never happened for me. But my attraction to Dostoevsky and Kafka, Franz Kafka, if you want to know about shame, if you want to experience what shame is, you know, don't read the textbooks about shame. Read Franz Kafka. Read the short stories of Franz Kafka, the metamorphosis, where he wakes up one morning and finds himself transformed into a gigantic insect. I mean, can you think of a better metaphor uh, for a person who's shame-based? And, and he, he always had this troubled relationship with his father. And there's a scene where he's scurrying back to his bedroom with his 50 little legs, and he gets caught in the door, and his father is beating him with a broom. <sighs> and I mean, if you want to... Do a, a deep breath about what it feels like to have an authoritarian father, to be a helpless child, to be getting shamed by a, an authoritarian father when you're a helpless child. It's an incredible kind of metaphor. And in the trial, Kafka says, Gregor Samsa woke up, uh, I mean, Joseph K. woke up one morning and found himself arrested, and he didn't know why. See, that happened to a lot of us. Uh, so suddenly you were indicted. You had this original sin. Uh, you had stain on you, and you didn't know why. So, so I was attracted to these people. This was my wonder child. I was uh, attracted to these people. I, I, I was moving toward them. I, I was working on Nietzsche. I was writing my dissertation on Nietzsche. Uh, and, and, and it was like, what well, the old ardor didn't like this. And I was considered to be a rebel. Now, now, in all fairness to the religious order that I was in, I was a rebel. I was attacking the old order. And I got drunk one night in the monastery. Now, this is frowned on. This is highly <laughs> frowned on. And I went running down the, you know, running down the corridor, screaming curses at my superiors. They, here I am within the old order. Uh, and, and, of course, they asked me to leave. Uh, I didn't walk gently into the night. Uh, it's not like, I, I, you know, I, it, it was a blessing, really, because I don't know whether I could have left. I was so dependent. And I remember riding the train back from Toronto, drinking ale, you know, kind of soothing, thinking I was the worst character that had ever lived because I'd failed. And I had an uncle who said, you know, you didn't have the guts to make it. You know, like this was an endurance contest. Uh, but then when I came home, I was absolutely floundered for about a year. Uh, I didn't know where to go. I was 31 years old. I didn't know how to drive a car. See, I'd gone in there at 19. I mean, at 21. We had never had a car. I didn't have enough money to have a car. I never learned to drive a car. I mean, I was really a, a child in a lot of ways. And I walked back out of there. But, but what I got, what I got when I began to do this work is that this was my child. This was my wonder child. And, 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 and he knew that I had to move on, that I couldn't have a life if I stayed in the old ardor. That, that, that this, this night of a Dionysian frenzy 
of being drunk uh, was kind of a rebellion, even though I felt terrible about it. I felt like I was rotten to the core. You know, I used to go to confession er and, and every morning because I thought I was so bad. I mean, you talk about shame. And, uh, and, and then when I came out of the seminary, uh, in, in some ways I was a failure to my family, and, and, though, and I was still a drinking alcoholic. So this was not a happy time. Uh, and, and yet, in all of that pain, in all of that trauma, what I realized was happening was a kind of ego death. Uh, that, that, that if, and, and what I'm driving at here is for you not to think of your trauma, not, not for you not to think of the pain in your life as something terrible. Uh, that, that it was terrible to go through it, yes, but, but look at it from another point of view. Maybe. Just maybe, you know, you can see some of the elements here, that it's like you, you really are unusual, that, that you are extraordinary, and the old order has been threatened by you, so you had to go into hiding. And you've, you've been in this elemental life, uh, and, and you, haven't, you haven't let yourself shine. You haven't let yourself be the star that you are, and, and that you haven't looked upon your trauma and your traumata you know, as something that was really positive, as something that was allowing, uh, in a sense, that old false self to die, that, that you didn't even know why you were rebelling. You see, I think every addict is in a spiritual emergency, that, that uh, the drinking, the drugging, the sexing, the whatever is an attempt to find transcendence, that you're trying to find ecstasy, that you're trying to get to something greater, but you don't know how. You don't know how. So you've gone to the chemicals uh, out of the wounded child, and, and that we, we can reframe that. Maybe you can, once you've done your, your original pain work, once you've done your uncovery work, once you've been willing to go through the legitimate suffering, you can begin to see your life as making sense in a way that it hasn't made sense to you. And, and that's what started happening to me. I began to realize that every piece of that was important. As crazy as I felt, as terrible as that period was, you know, between leaving the seminary and beginning to try to find some place. I'm 31 years old. I've been an office boy and a grocery checker. Uh, I don't know how to drive a car. Uh, so, so it was like, an incredible time in my life, and yet something kept pushing me on. I kept, I kept regenerating, if you will. I, I, I kept doing, you know, I, I got jobs, and uh, uh, after the guy brought me down to the freeway, I went and got a job, uh, and, and uh, I, I got into a 12-step program. Well, I wound up in a state hospital. I wound up committing myself to a state hospital. And that was the end. That was the ultimate ego death. That was the death of the false self. See, spiritual masters talk about that you have to die to the ego. The ego being that socio-cultural false self that everybody's got. Now, now it's not like you can give it up. Everybody's got to have some, some ego boundary. But in a sense, you've got to always get that you're more than that. You're more than that. You're more than anyone could ever define you as because there is, a, there is a place within you where, in a sense, you are the only one that's going to know who you are. It's what Jack Swartz calls the knowing self rather than the believing self. See, I promised when we began this series that we would be moving toward wholeness, empowerment. I don't want to be a survivor. I don't want to be a multi-generational accident. Uh, I don't want to be an adult child all my life. I want to move toward creativity, empowerment, and choosing my own life. And as I connect, as I connect with this wonder child in me, and as I realize that there's been something that sends chills down my back when I'm talking right now, that has always been pushing me to regenerate, to overcome. See, and that can't be the false self because the false self's so busy hiding, 
guarding, being defensive. I mean, what pushed me to, to do something about my drinking? Part of it was pain. What, what pushes any of us to change? Certainly one part of it is pain. Pain is a great teacher. Pain will often move us to do something about our life. But what I began to see is that all of that was important to me. That whole rebellion and leaving the seminary. And I, I don't want to put the, you know, the, the order of priests that I was, I don't want to put them down. I learned. I had a wonderful education. Uh, there were good, wonderful people there. But for me, it, it was just a, it was a place that I had gone out of my original pain. And I was reenacting my family history. So what that kind of awareness has helped me to do is to really understand that at least the point I'm at in my life in the journey to wholeness is to begin to look at my life differently, to start look at the places that, that strength came to me. See, Leon Blois, a French novelist, once said, there are places in the heart that do not yet exist. Pain must be in order that they be. And, and Gibran, the deeper that sorrow carves into our being, the more joy we can contain. It's not the cup that holds your wine, the very cup that was burned in the potter's oven. It's not the lute that plays your music, the very lute that was whittled with knives. I, I think that as we become more and more enlightened, more and more conscious, more and more spiritual, we begin to understand the tragic and ambivalent nature of all life, including my life and your life, and that what I need to do is capitalize and reframe it. There's a whole technique in therapy called reframing. Milton Erickson, who I talked about earlier, was one of the great reframers. Milton Erickson was a hypnotherapist. He was in, he was in Mexico one time, and, and he was doing a demonstration on the stage, and they brought a client up to him who spoke, Spanish and not English, and Erickson didn't speak Eng Spanish. So he is going, supposed to hypnotize this guy. And, and when Erickson wrote about this case, he said, this was an unprecedented opportunity <laughs> for creativity. See, I mean, what a wonderful way to think. This is an unprecedented opportunity for creativity, for me to see, to reach down, and, and, and to call on something. See, I think that creativity overcomes violence. That, that when we think about, you know, sometimes I'll talk about corporal punishment and be, hitting children and saying, you know, we don't need to do that. And people say, well, what do you do if you can't hit them? You know, now we got some folks down in Texas that, you know, uh, and, and, and I'll say, well, can't we as bright adults come up with some more alternatives? You know, I think we can probably figure something else out than, than, than sit there and use hairbrushes and fly swat, swatters and belts and when we're five times this little person's height, that we can figure some other stuff out. And, and so life is about creativity and reframing helps us to see that, that there's no one interpretation that's right. Uh, you know, when Werner uh, came along with Est, uh, it was like, do you get it? Do you get it that there are many interpretations? Alfred Adler used to say, it could all be otherwise. Uh, that, that it's always an interpretation. It's an interpretation. It's the way we're looking at it. So reframing. I've heard Leslie Bandler talk about a piece of work she did with a woman whose family just hated her because she was obsessive, compulsive, driving everybody crazy, sweeping the rugs, you know, sweeping after them. Uh, if, you sent, you know, if you sent your jockey strap it, for cleaning, she'd have a pair of shorts built around it when it came back uh, uh, because she was so compulsive. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, the family didn't even want to be around her anymore. And so Leslie's doing this piece of work with her. He says, well... You know, you see your house, you're walking through your house, and you see your house totally clean. There's not a speck of dust anywhere. There's this beautiful rug, not a footprint on it, because nobody's there. 
And, and, you know, suddenly the woman just starts sobbing, just starts sobbing. Because, you see, what she did was reframe this. She helped her to look at it from another point of view. And, and, And this is a wonderful ability that our wonder child has to begin to look at life from a different point of view, to look at your tragedy, to look at your trauma. And and believe me, I know that that's difficult, that some of you have been through things that I can't imagine. When I do these workshops with people, I cannot believe the things people have been through, that they survived as children. It, 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 It astonishes me. Sometimes I cannot walk through the groups because the the pain is just too great. Uh, and I just can't take it. Uh, I had a guy uh, in a workshop in Connecticut in, with Braille, and everybody in his group was just sobbing, just sobbing. You know, as he told this, oh, heart-rending story of the way he had been treated in his blindness. And, and I, I can't imagine what that would be like. And yet, and yet, you see, each of us have our own story, and each of us have our own journey. And each of us have our own myth myth that we have to live. So what I'd like to do right now with you is I want to do a little meditation with you that I do. And and this is a very common meditation uh, in the sense that a lot of people who work with transpersonal psychology, which which is that spiritual level, uh, it's it's a meditation that is called the purpose of your life meditation. But, but we're looking at it now from the point of view of, a, of your higher consciousness. We want to look at your life now from the wonder child's point of view. Like if you were looking at your, your life from this higher self point of view, how would you see, how would you reframe the events of your life? So what I'd like you to do, if you will, is just close your eyes for a moment. Take a couple of nice deep breaths. And just imagine that once again you're standing before that door and you're opening the door, walking down the hallway. But this time you don't go to a room you go to a porch, like you walk out on a porch, and you're standing out on a porch, like you could just be looking out into the universe from this porch. And just imagine that you could see some stairs coming down from out of the clouds. And whatever this means to you, you saw your higher power walking down those stairs to get you whatever that means to you, and that the hand was outstretched and you were being asked to walk up those stairs. And as you walk up those stairs, I want you just to imagine and as if that you are a unique manifestation of the divine that you have a destiny that only you can express, that it's not dramatic or melodramatic, it's just the difference that you make, and that your child has always known what that purpose is. Just accept that for this moment, that you have a special and uniqueness that is unlike anyone else, and you're walking up these stairs now with your higher power towards some kind of temple or church or synagogue or something with marble, marble pillars, and that you walk into this temple and you see a statue of a child and that the child is you. You see that this is a statue of you as a child. And your higher power says your child knows. Your child knows the purpose what your purpose is. And see that statue come alive. See that child, this radiant child. Just imagine yourself in in the most beautiful radiance. Whatever way that comes to you, it comes with golden light or 
white light, but the child walks down and embraces you, and the child tells you, gives you some kind of symbol, some kind of meaning, words maybe, a feeling, that gives you some sense of, of this is the purpose of my life. This is the purpose of my life. And I may not even understand it fully. I may not understand this fully, but I'm just going to accept it. And I'm going to take it from the child, whatever this symbol is, whatever this feeling is, whatever this meaning is. And just thank the child. Just thank the child and just take that child into your heart. You've reclaimed this child. And in this internal imagery, just take this child into your heart. And with your higher power, walk back out of the temple. Walk back down the stair, this long stairway, back to the porch or the veranda, and just stand there with your child in your heart, with your higher power there, whatever that is for you, and just see that stairway disappear. And just imagine you could see yourself being born. You could see the little infant that you once were coming into this world. But now you're looking at this birth. You're looking at this birth of a divine child, of a child that has a purpose. And you can look at your mother, and you can look at your father, and you can look at whoever else is there. And it's like a, a very slow film is beginning to run. And you're looking at some events in your life. You're looking at your toddlerhood. And maybe some event is going to come to you. Some, something, some memory that suddenly is significant to you in a way it wasn't before. That, oh yeah, I see now why that happened in terms of my purpose. And you see yourself as a preschooler. And just let any event come up for you that may come up that you can remember, an aunt or an event or maybe a trauma that happened to you. And then your school days. You see yourself going through school. Maybe that was a rough time for you. And you've always wondered, why did I, you know, why did I have to go through this kind of pain? And maybe you can see that differently. And, and then your adolescence and your early life, suddenly just looking at all the events of your life. And you're seeing that, you're seeing it from a larger perspective. You're seeing it from, from a different point of view. That maybe all that suffering meant something after all. Maybe with this symbol or this word or this sense that I've been given, all that made sense. It ma makes a different kind of sense. And then just come right up to your present life. Let yourself come right up to your present life. And maybe, you know, maybe it didn't tell you anything very dramatic. But just, just right now in this room, just feel a kind of connection with everybody in this room. That all of us are on a journey. That all of us are on a heroic journey. That we're struggling. That all human beings struggle. That all life has an ambivalent character to it. That there is a tragic sense to life and that each part of it can be overcome and that each part of it has a purpose. And just feel a sense of connection with everybody in this room. Everybody watching, feel a sense of connection that we're all on this planet, we're on a spaceship and we all belong here together. That we're all human beings and we're all struggling. And we all have a purpose. 
And just whatever you got out of that, maybe it wasn't very dramatic, just thank your higher self or your higher power or what, whoever, whatever, and, and, and know that you can go back and do this kind of exercise some more and that your deep consciousness may know, may help you to see in a way that your limited ego consciousness cannot see. So just allow yourself just very slowly to walk off that porch, back down that hallway, back through the door. And as you walk through the door, just turn around and see the door. Take a deep breath, nice deep breath. And feel the chair that you're sitting in. Feel your clothes on your body. And just very, very slowly, just open your eyes. Now, I encourage you later on to share that, to share that, even if it, it seemed like you got nothing out of it. Uh, the first time I did that kind of meditation, I, you know, I, I couldn't understand uh, what the symbol was, and uh, it, it, it didn't work very well for me. But I did it again. I've done it several times. And what I've come to see is that every single event in my life has prepared me to be standing here right now. It's that my life purpose has been to do what I'm doing, has been to find my own self and to witness to that and to be, in whatever way I could, a guide for other people to find freedom and, and equality. And that I needed an alcoholic daddy. And I needed the family that I was brought up with. And that from this higher consciousness point of view, it was all perfect. Now, believe me, that would not work if I hadn't done my ego work, if I hadn't done my original pain work. If you're sitting here, if you're watching, and you're an incest victim, don't, don't do this kind of meditation until you've done your work. If you're an abuse victim, if you're a an abandonment victim. You don't do this. You don't jump into higher consciousness without going through lower consciousness. But a lot of people try to do that. I tried to do it. I tried to jump beyond the legitimate suffering and go into high levels of meditation. Uh, I've seen people go into the Course in Miracles. I've seen them go into high levels of consciousness, which are very beautiful things if you've done the ego work. Ken Kyes, who's a friend of mine, was sharing with me recently how important it has been to understand toxic shame because he couldn't understand because he's a beautiful human being teaching unconditional love. Why people can't get that? Well, if you've got all these blocks from your childhood, you know, if you had a father that beat you and incested you, you're going to have a hard time saying our father. It's not going to be the same thing for you. And so we've got to heal that pain. We've got to finish the past. We've got to finish our own unfinished business before we're ready to begin to move into that higher consciousness. Now, that's my belief. There may be people who argue with that. But, but it, it, it comes to me so clearly when I do that meditation that every single thing that I have ever done has been preparing me for what my life is now. Every piece of it, things that, that seemed silly, that, that did not seem to have any purpose, have all come together and had purpose for me. Now, you know, life is good if it, if it is good. And right now, my life is good. And it's a lot easier to say this when your life is good than if you're in pain, than if you're in heartache, than if there's all kinds of stuff going on in your life. But I believe that ultimately we are all called to be this special one that we are. And I believe that the journey that I've been taking you on in this series is a journey toward your wholeness. And I believe with all my heart that this child, while I don't want to idealize the child, 
The child lives in the now or for the now. I think we can live in the now, but not for the now. Uh, that, that the child is a rich part of ourselves, but we are also grown-ups. However, I think that to some degree, our future will depend on how much we're willing to embrace this vulnerable child. Ashley Montague wrote a book called Growing Young. Ashley Montague is a Princeton anthropologist. He's one of my fathers. I was with him in Keystone last summer, and he went, he did the whole inner child thing with me and uh, shared his book with me. And in this book, he's a brilliant anthropologist. He's written 50 books, and he talks about neotomy. Neotomy is a word used for childlike traits. And his argument is, as an anthropologist, that the civilizations that have survived the longest are the neotoma civilizations. The civilizations that carry into adult life the traits of the child, that, that, that have as part of their adult life spontaneity, resilience, all those things we talked about as the wonder child or as the wonderful child. And I know you know the book that's been on the New York Times, Everything I Needed to Learn, I Learned in Kindergarten. Uh, where he says, think of what a better world it would be, the whole world, if every day at 3 o'clock we had cookies and cold milk, you know, Bush and Gorbachev, you know, drinking cold milk and wrapping up in their bankies, <laughs> what, what a better world it would be. And, and, and if we put things back where we got them and if we didn't hit people, and we flushed, uh, <laughs> and he says, eh, or if we had a basic policy in our nation to always put things back where we found them and cleaned up our own messes, and it'll still be true, no matter how old you are, when you go out in the world, it's best to hold hands and stick together. What, what a beautiful idea. What a simple idea. And one of Montague's arguments is, is that the child elicits in us a tenderness. See, so that when people are willing to be vulnerable, when I'm willing to show you my child, when I'm willing to be vulnerable, I, I can elicit a closeness from you that I could not elicit if I were not willing to be that because it touches your child and your vulnerability. So I think that this idea of neotomy is a very, very important idea. And that civilization may stand or fall on what, how much we're willing to bring this into our lives. So, you know, to me, this whole issue of the inner child is not just a cutesy little faddish thing that we're suddenly doing workshops and we're sitting with our teddy bears. I think it's the most serious issue of anything that's going on. That, that the, the major source of human problems are based on this child that didn't get his or her needs met. Now, I also think, you know, that when E.T. stood next to Elliot and he said, home, Elliot, home, there wasn't a dry eye in the place, because I think that that touched something else about the divine child in exile, that it touched something very deep. Somebody said, even after Dante and Shakespeare and Mozart, we say, is that all? Is that all? This is what I call the metaphysical blues. It's like, no matter how good it gets, no matter how much you achieve, there's some kind of a longing that is still in us. Eric Fromm once said, you know, wouldn't it be strange if we had eyes and there was nothing to see? If we had ears and there was nothing to hear? If we had a mind and there was nothing to think? Wouldn't it be strange if there was nothing to go with this longing? See, so I believe that this longing is about something much more profound. I believe it's about my creator. I believe with the wounded child, Augustine, who said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless till they repose in thee. 
Now, that's my belief, that somehow we have another home, and that'll be homecoming indeed. But the wounded child, the wonder child in me, the wonder child says, but wait a minute, we have to go on. You know, Gandhi, Gandhi said almost everything we do is insignificant, but we must do it. It's most important that we do it. So somehow we must go on, and that regeneration, that regeneration is the wounded child, the wonder child. Here's another statement. We must not make the past the only light for the ensuing years. A new leaf must be turned and new ideas read. We must hear things that have never been heard before. Thus will a new world arise, David Polis. And my friend Terry Garsky in Chicago, who says growth is moving from one set of problems to a better set of problems. <laughs> what, a, what a beautiful idea. That, that life is about problem, it's about regeneration, and we need this child because this child is the source of resilience and regeneration. And Shaw said it beautifully. He said, this is the true meaning of life, to live for something recognized by yourself to be a mighty cause, to be a force of nature rather than a feverish little clod of grievances and ailments complaining that the universe is not devoting itself to making you happy. Life is its own splendid justification, he said. I want to be used up when I die because the harder I work, the more I live. I don't believe that life is a flickering candle, he said. I believe it's a splendid torch, and I want to make it burn as bright as I can before I hand it on to my children and to other generations. That's the, that's the regeneration of the wonder child. That, that, isn't that beautiful? It just touches, it sends chills down my back. That, that idea uh, of, of just committing myself to life. And, and I want to end this series with, I'm going to paraphrase this because I don't know the quotation. Somebody handed me a thing one time. He said, this was from a, a bishop talking to his missionaries. And uh, it, it's a very powerful statement of the kind of regeneration and commitment to life that, that I've been talking about tonight. And I'm going to paraphrase it my own way. Uh, he said, people are often mean and cruel and irresponsible, but love people anyway. What you build today may be torn down tomorrow but build today anyway. If you commit yourself to goodness, people may attack you for false piety, but commit yourself to goodness anyway. If you try to help people, they'll often resent you and feel dependent, but try to help people anyway. Give the world the best you've got. Commit with every ounce and fiber of your being, and you may get kicked in the pants. But give the world the best you've got and give it every fiber of your being anyway. And that's what I want to leave you with and hope with all my heart that you'll make that commitment to this beautiful adventure that we're all on called life. Thank you.